part two of chapter nine, head and neck anatomy. The blood supply to the head and the neck. It is important to be able to locate the larger blood vessels of the head and neck because these ves vessels may become compromised by disease or during dental procedures, such as local anesthetic injections. And by the way, you guys are not going to be giving the anesthetic injections. The doctor is. You guys will only be um, putting on the topical. Topical is like the little uh, gel that they put on your gums before the anesthetic to kind of numb the gums a little bit so you'll feel the, the needle less. Major arteries of the face and oral cavity. Common carotid artery, it arises from the aorta and subdivides into the internal and external carotid arteries. The internal carotid artery, it supplies blood to the brain and the eyes and the external External carotid artery, facial artery, lingual artery, maxillary artery, and mandibular artery. And they're pretty much self-explanatory. Each one is named after uh, pretty much what uh, they supply blood to. Major veins of the face and the oral cavity. The maxillary vein, the retromandibular vein, external jugular vein, the subclavian vein, facial vein, common facial vein, deep facial vein, lingual veins, and internal jugular veins. Okay, and by the way, guys, um, on the question on pretest, on the pretest, um, it stated that what were the bones the, that were on the sides that formed the sides of the cranium? So they, um, I know that parietal um, is, they're paired bones, but what they wanted to for you guys to really know was that it are the temporal bones, which are, are on each side of the head. So everybody was having a little bit of an issue with um, that question. The nerves of the head and neck. Understanding the nerves of the head and the neck is important for the use of local anesthesia during dental treatment. The nerves are related to certain conditions of the face, such as facial paralysis. And this is facial paralysis. And this is, um, you can also call this uh, Bell's palsy. Um, you'll probably hear that a lot. And this is caused either, um, it can be caused by strokes. Um, and this can also be call, uh, caused, uh, Bell's palsy in specific. It can be caused when you're like in a hot area, like if you're inside a hot apartment or a house. And then it's winter time and you go outside, this can happen. Like the side of your face will start to, to droop and that's called Bell's palsy. Cranial nerves. There are 12 pairs of cranial nerves, all connected to the brain. These nerves serve both sensory and motor functions. The cranial nerves are generally named for the area or function they served and are also identified with the use of Roman numerals. Okay, and here we have the 12 cranial nerves and number one is the olfactory nerve, which of course has to do with the nose. Um, number two is the optic nerve, has to do with eyes. The oculomotor nerve, also trochlear nerve, abducens nerve, trigeminal nerve, okay, the medulla, uh, the cerebellum, which is the back of the brain on the bottom, the spinal cord, the glossopharyngeal nerve, the hypoglossal nerve, spinal accessory nerve, vestibulocochlear nerve, and this is in the ear, and then facial nerves. Okay, so the olfactory nerve, which is uh, Roman numeral one, it's sensory, and it has to do with the sense of smell. The optic nerve, which is Roman numeral number two, also sensory, is the sense of sight. Number three is the oculomotor, which is a motor type of nerve, and it's the movement of the eye muscles. And the trochlear, which is Roman numeral four, is also motor, which also has to do with the movement of eye muscles. Now, number five is trigeminal, and it's a motor uh, nerve, and it has to do with the movement of muscles of mastication and other cranial muscles. It's also sensory 
which is the general sensations for face, head, skin, teeth, oral cavity, and the tongue. So number six, the abducens, it's a motor nerve movement of the eye muscles as well. Uh, seventh is a facial, which can be both motor and sensory. So the motor one um, has to do with facial expression, functions of glands and muscle, and the sensory one has to, the, has to do with the sense of taste on the tongue. Uh, now, number eight is the vestib vestibulocochlear uh, nerve, which is sensory, and it's the senses of sound and balance have to do with your ear. And um, with this nerve, sometimes when you have um, problems in the inner ear, um, that's when you get vertigo, which is a problem with balance. And it usually um, has to do with your uh, with something that's going on in the ear. Uh, number nine, which is the glossopharyngeal, which is the mo it can be both motor and sensory. It's functioning of the parotid gland, and then the general sensation of skin around the ear. Now the vagus, which is eight, I mean ten, sorry, motor. It could be both motor and sensory. The motor moves muscles into the in soft palate, the pharynx and the larynx. So it's pretty much in the back of the throat. And sensory is the general sensation on skin around ear and the sense of taste. Now number 11 is the accessory nerve, which is motor. And it's movement of the muscles of the neck, the soft palate and the pharynx. And the hypoglossal, motor, which is also motor, is movement of the muscles of the tongue. The innervation of the oral cavity. The trigeminal nerve is the primary source of innervation for the oral cavity. The trigeminal nerve subdivides into three main branches, maxillary, mandibular, and ophthalmic, which is not discussed in this chapter. The maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve supplies the maxillary teeth the periosteum, the mucous membrane, maxillary sinuses, and the soft palate. It subdivides into the nasopalatine nerve, the greater palatine nerve, anterior superior alveolar nerve, middle superior alveolar nerve, and posterior superior alveolar nerve. The mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve um, is divided into three. The buccal nerve, which supplies branches to the buccal mucous membrane and mucoperiosteum of the mandibular molar teeth. The lingual nerve supplies the anterior two-thirds of the tongue and gives off branches to supply the lingual mucous membrane and mucoperiosteum. The inferior alveolar nerve further subdivides into the mylohyoid nerve, the mental nerve, the incisive nerve, and small dental nerves that supply the molar and premolar teeth alveolar process and the periosteum. Okay, so this is um, the this is a diagram of where the palatal, lingual, and buccal innervation nerves are. So here, this is the incisive foramen. We said in the previous chapter, the foramen means like an opening. You can't see it, but it's, it's under the gums. Okay, the nasal palatine nerve, anterior palatine nerve, and the greater palatine foramen which is a, like two little openings on the back. And you will learn um, as you start working with in procedures with the doctor, you will learn where he can give anesthetic to numb certain areas of the mouth. Not all of the mouth, but usually the air, just a certain like uh, kind of um, not quadrant. It can be a quadrant or it could be a sextant of where he needs to uh, numb depending on where he's working at. Lymph nodes of the head and the neck. A dental professional must examine and palpate the lymph nodes of the head and neck very carefully during extraoral examination. Enlarged lymph nodes may indicate infection or cancer, and usually the dentist will do this. The lymph nodes for the oral cavity drain intraoral structures such as teeth, as well as the eyes, the ears, the nasal cavity, and deeper areas of the throat. Structure and function of lymph nodes. Lymph nodes are small and round or oval structures located in lymph vessels. The major sites of lymph nodes include cervical, which is in the neck, axillary, which are under the arms, and then in inguinal, which is in the lower abdomen. The lymph nodes of the head are classified as superficial, which is near the surface, or deep. 
Superficial lymph nodes of the head. There are five groups of superficial lymph nodes in the head. The occipital, retroauricular, anterior auricular, superficial parotid, and facial nodes. Superficial lymph nodes of the head. And then again, they are um, here at the diagram, they're naming all the um, lymph nodes of the head. Lymphadenopathy. When a patient has an infection or cancer in a particular region, the lymph nodes in that region will respond by increasing in size and becoming very firm. Lymphadenopathy. Lymphadenopathy results from an increase in both the size of each lymphocyte and the overall cell count in the lymphoid tissue. With an increase in the size and number of lymphocytes, the body is better able to fight the disease. Paranasal sinuses. The paranasal sinuses are air-containing spaces within the skull that communicate with the nasal cavity. The functions of the sinuses include producing mucus, making the bones of the skull lighter, and providing resonance that helps produce sound. The sinuses are named for the bones in which they are located. The maxillary sinuses are the largest of the paranasal sinuses. The frontal sinuses are located within the forehead, just above the eyes. The ethmoid sinuses are irregularly shaped air cells separated from the orbital cavity by a very thin layer of bone. The sphenoid sinuses are located close to the optic nerves where an infection may damage vision. Okay, the frontal sinuses, the ethmoid sinuses, the sphenoid sinuses, and the maxillary sinuses. Usually when you have a cold, you will feel a lot of the pressure on the frontal sinuses and most of the time on the maxillary sinuses, or it can be behind the eyes, it depends. 